and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, me I have a newcomer into the temple, a story that, a story that was four years in the making. And the some of you may know him as one as one of the Mad Men behi behind um Inf Infinity. Some of you more recently may know him as the Madder Man behi behind Hogwarts Legacy. Love it or leave it, but he is Troy Levitt. <laughs> wow, that was quite the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I tr I tr I try with these with these kind of things. All right. So, well, here we are. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you for the uh, opportunity to be on your show, and, and thank you for the nice long introduction there. Where I guess I learned all about. <laughs> spent, well, it's been like what? What'd you say? Like four years or something here before I was finally able to come visit you here in the in the uh, the, the temple. Mm-hmm. And well, for me, good things come to those who wait. That's usually the case. So. I so I suppose this I suppose the be, I suppose the best place to st to start in this little in this little adventure is um how is how you how you first how you first delved into um ga game development because you you had been you had been doing it for 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 quite a while the first unless I'm mistaken the first um entry that you have on your gameography was VR Stalker all the way back in '94. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's the first game that I think I'm credited in, uh, and there it would just be in the special thanks. But yeah, that was a, that was the first game that I commercially released game that uh, I contributed to as far as video games go. Prior to that, um, I mean, if if we go if we turn back the clock, clear back to uh, high school days, and I know that your channel here. Uh, here in the temple, you talk a lot about role-playing games and, and just games in general, game mm -hmm. development. But you know, I was I was a bit of a, a role player uh, in high school. Uh, I remember getting a blue box edition of Dungeons and Dragons, like in what that 1977, I think, something like that. Yeah, that'd probably so, be given the timeline. That'd probably be like the Moldave version. If we're yeah, I'm. I'm I don't know what it was. Just the blue box version to me. It was, you know, yeah, that, the, the very yeah, that, first edition. That that'd be that. It's when it comes to first edition D and D, things get complicated because there's there are a, there are about four or five different versions of first edition. Yeah, I, I I remember the version I had. Maybe you can tell me it was one I picked up at the local five and dime when I was I think still in junior high. And what I remember about it is I think the, the little dice came inside one of those plastic sheets you had to, like, pop them out of, you know, and then you'd file off the ends and, and you'd color in the numbers with a little wax crayon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, tr that <laughs> tracks. Those, dra those dra they, called, they called them dragon dice. Um, they have oh, been yeah. a subject of mockery and ridicule for how the, how the edges would get worn off very easily and it would turn into a ball. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Well, I'm, a, I'm just, uh, because you're asking about, you know, the video games and how I got there, I'm thinking, you know, 10 years earlier than that, I was doing the the role-playing games and playing with friends in high school and in college, and then uh, that transitioned into video games because uh, a lot of role-playing games started playing like the Ultima series mm -hmm. uh, that were very much like the Dungeons & Dragons games. And then there was the, the Forgotten, was it Forgotten Pools or something like that? And I just remember playing those um, as a gamer before I even started making video games. Although my first games that I started making were to imitate some of the design of those other RPGs. Yeah, it's always fun. It's always funny when people act like there's th there's this dividing line between tabletop RPGs and video games when they've been when they've been joined at the hip in one form or another all the way all the way back in the um, 70s. Um, yes. Are you are you you probably didn't have it at any point, but are you are you familiar with the Plato um, servers? 
No, I am not familiar with that. That was a very early um, computer networking thing that was exclusive to I think I think one college campus, but a lot but a lot of it's a lot of pre-internet stuff was kind was kind of formed through through those servers and one of the games that was of it was that was available in that little project was a D&D hack yeah I, uh, I, I was not aware of that I, I I do I do recall um like Prior to EverQuest stuff, there were all those mushes and muds, and, and you'd, you'd dial up on a modem, you know, that would dial in, and only one person could be playing at once. You'd make so many moves on the computer mm -hmm. server, and then somebody else's turn would go, and, and that's how those old, uh, you know, original kind of RPG versions yeah. on the server used to really get a dial in. Um, so, so I remember those, the muds and the mushes, that then later became EverQuest, which then later became, you know, uh, World of Warcraft. Once well, they kind of developed. there is but there yeah. is one little detail when it comes to when it comes to muds, and I I do have to correct right. myself. Um, the um, Plato thing that started in the '60s, just just in the University of Illinois, and then a bunch of terminals came around all, came around all over the place, but it was still pretty bleeding edge even at that time, but before before M the reason mud is short is um short for multi-user dungeon is because yeah. it's is because it is built on an unlicensed port of zork called dungeon spelled d u n g e n oh i didn't know that yeah <laughs> on zork huh? on the back of zork so they took infocom and <laughs> that's interesting yeah yeah it when i and when I say unlicensed port, it was basically a fork of it, much in the same way that, like, Miss Pac-Man was a midway-owned fork of the original Pac-Man that was made by a couple of hackers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I was not aware of that mm -hmm. way back in the day. But um, I guess uh, you were asking me kind of about the, the video game history, but that's, that's kind of, you know, I, I did the RPG thing, and then I moved into computer games, um, and that's where my career's been since like 1995 until 2021 when I retired. Mm -hmm. um, for about like, oh. 26 years of just working in games. Yeah. And I'm I'm aware that bringing up VR Stalker was a bit of a deep cut because that was exclu that was a flight sim on the on the 3DO. And yep, that's right. That's good that you got that. Wow. Yeah. And well, mo um. The only reason the only reason I even I even have passing un, passing understanding of the 3DO is largely be get largely begins and ends with my tumultuous relationship with the Might and Magic series. Most oh, <laughs> oh. yeah, I, I, I remember playing like uh, the Might and Magic series, the, the like Clouds of Zine and all that sort of stuff or mm -hmm. whatever. But, but I, tell me uh, what you were gonna... well. It has to do. It has to do with the fact that there there were various ups and downs. Um, I w I will ad I will admit that I ended up getting into it late and mo mostly through Heroes of Might and Magic, and then worked my way backwards oh. and then for and then forwards again. Um, the thing the thing that I will always take away is um. Whenever there's the when it, when there are those really stupid debates about about how about how about the about WRPG versus JRPG, two terms I really don't care for. Um, people would always talk about how how much more grounded how much more grounded the Western end of RPGs was, and I'm like, did none of you people play Might and Magic, where it's, where so much of it so much of it feels like a um a t a um a Discworld s crack fic, <laughs> like. You think, oh, oh, it's oh, it's called Heroes and Might and Magic. It'll probably it'll probably be a straight fantasy story. Then you start getting into fucking a aliens and la and laser guns and shit. Oh yeah, they did that in the yeah, like the uh, in the later versions or whatever. Right, I remember in the in the heroes, the heroes games. Right, those were the tactical games. Yeah. Where you move them pieces around, and I don't remember the the lasers and the monsters and that, but that I do was... remember it. In, <laughs> RPG things, yeah, yeah. That, um, both both of them went weird in their in their own different ways. Um, I have made the running joke of of heroes and might and magic to um, 
I, be I believe it was um, it was either two or three that I made the joke about it being perfectly balanced. And by perfectly balanced, I mean everybody tries to get the genie, and you get the genie, and that's the end. You already win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because it was not ba it was not balanced. It was a case of a lot of magic and maybe some might. Uh. And of course, yeah, a lot of those games. They, they, yeah, balance. It seems like, especially because they were single player games back then. They, you weren't playing and you know against or with other players. It was perfectly okay for games to be wildly imbalanced. It, you know, if you could break it, it didn't matter so much. That kind of thing in single player, I don't, I don't have a problem with. But Heroes yeah, of Might and Magic had a multiplayer option. <laughs> yeah, then then you ruin it. Yeah. Yeah. The, now we're now we're starting to get into the problems. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I couldn't. I couldn't help but I couldn't help but notice that with some with some of the early stuff that you had that you had handled, it was um, either le either leaning into simulation or it or um, a fair a fair bit of um, wrestling of all things. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> Raw is War back in night back in ninety five, Anarchy Rules back in two thousand. And um, Legend Legends of Wrestling in two thousand two. Yeah, I uh, I did my stint there and and the wrestling games there for a while. Um, which was you know I wasn't really much of a wrestling fan, but uh, once they started making those games out there to claim, you become a fan. You have to study it, and so that was the era of the introduction of, of The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin was really hot and The Undertaker, and that, that was that era. You know. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, I could I could definitely see that with with say with say Raw is War, um, but but um, some when when it came to do when it came to doing Anarchy Rules, did you end up getting sent tapes to st to study or something like that? Yeah, Anarchy Rules was a really funny case. Um, so the uh, the claim lost the rights temporarily to the WWF, and so they picked up the rights to ECW, and they just wanted any wrestling game they could, and so they, they put it on us, the little Salt Lake City studio, to make a wrestling game with this new licensed property in like only nine months, and asked me to be the producer, and, and we just tried to bust that thing out based on VHS tapes that they had sent us of, like, these guys, you know, breaking through tables and jumping on chairs, kind of the wilder, like, bloodier side of wrestling. Um, and so we put that out. I don't, I don't remember if it sold very well, but then immediately they went back and got the license um, again to the WWE through a claim. But that was the story is that they just they had picked up the license. They wanted a game real fast. And we just happened to get it dropped in their lap to get made in Salt Lake City. Yeah. Uh, but then there's Legends of Wrestling, which wasn't built on any one promotion, but just this grab bag of a, bu of a bunch of different wrestlers from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like and, and I think Legends of Wrestling did really well for for a claim that yeah, they kind of did that grab back. Yeah, cause I could see I could see that one requiring a bit more specific of research because it's it's not like it's not like in say Raw, Raw is War or Anarchy Rules where you can where you can be given just one particular um, promotions um, shows or pay per views, but ha but having to grab a bunch having to grab a bunch of stuff from different eras and different. Um, promotions, especially the territory days. Yeah, what, I recall that when we were making that, that um, the New York office was very much engaged in a, a lot of licensing and a lot of um, you know looking up some old wrestlers just so they could include them in under the legends heading. You know, guys who hadn't wrestled for years and years. I can't remember the names of them um, at the time, but but uh, yeah, that that was part of the shtick for that Legends of Wrestling game was they wanted to get as many kind of big wrestlers under one heading. And I think it did very, very well for a claim. But in spite of that, you know, bad management still ran that whole organization into the ground. Um, yeah. <laughs> claim to that one. I've, I had, I had learned, I had, I've, I've heard my fair share of stories about, about some of the um, unfortunate decisions that a claim did over the years. Um, some of them more infamous than others, like the, like the be like the be everything about BMX triple X or the whole advertising the whole advertising on headstones which 
I think I think a I think a two year class can be t- can be done just on what not to do. Looking at the way Midway and Acclaim advertises their games in the two thousands. Yeah, the, the the head of Acclaim at the time, Gregory Fishback. I remember him um, being so impressed by the sales of, of Grand Theft Auto at the time that he thought it was all about just being edgy. Right? It's just got to be edgy, and so he was pushing all the games to have some sort of edge in them, even if it didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And that's how we got the, the BMX Triple X version. We're going to have a BMX racing game, but they're going to somehow put in you know, strippers or something into this game where it didn't make sense. And it did about as well as everybody thought it would. It was just a gimmicky game that, that was not very good, really. But but that was that was the way that the market was leaning at the time. It was mm-hmm. kind of this, like, what... And you know what? It's always been like that when I think about it. And I bet it's like that everywhere is that once a product becomes very popular, all the other uh, uh, other organizations try and copy them, right? And they're like, well, let's just do the exact same thing, or they think they know what it is, and then they try and push it into places where it doesn't make any sense. And to me, that's a perfect case. That, yeah, uh, I'd, I'd say in a lot of cases, you, I've seen, I've seen way too many stories of people, um, di- people disunderstanding. Um, if I do, if I do use a, a recent example. <laughs> Um, it has been funny seeing some of the more clicky ends of game development um, coping and seething regarding the success of Baldur's Gate 3. And oh. I remember one person claiming that the main reason it was successful was by having the D&D name. When, if you look at the history of D&D video games, it is anything but consistent. Right, yeah, I, I, I would agree. In fact, I um, had that conversation with another... Uh, fellow recently, I'm like, do you think that the Dungeons and Dragons name figured into the success of Baldur's Gate 3? And his position was no, hardly at all, because you know, people know about Dungeons and Dragons, but nobody, like, buys or goes to a movie or buys a game just because it says Dungeons and Dragons, or very few. It had to be more than that. And I agree. You know, I, I think... Uh, I had a had lengthy conversation with, with a buddy of mine about the recent Honor Among Thieves movie, because um, when that thing was going forward, I had predicted that it was go- that it was going to get killed, and that was before I found out when it was going to come out, and it- and the fact that it was going to come out mere days after John Wick Chapter Four, and a f- and a couple weeks before the Mario movie. And I'm like, this thing's fucked from the get go. <laughs> but yeah. I had s- I had a lot of times, um, movies based on video games are doomed are doomed to failure. In and, and sometimes because they pick because they pick the wrong one. If you're picking an adaptation that's just an interactive knockoff of a popular movie, you get what you pay for. But in the case of Dungeons and Dragons, the problem the problem with doing that is the only way you could reasonably pull it off is not by doing a D and D movie per se, but by doing, say, a Forgotten Realm a Forgotten Realms movie about Drizzt or a um I was gonna say a I was gonna say a Dragonlance movie, but that was already tried and it didn't work. <laughs> or a or some something to that extent, because the big appeal with D and D is this in, is being able to live out the equivalent of your of your favorite fantasy epics. So yeah, once you yeah. take away the interactive part, what do you have? Just a bunch of fantasy tropes that are gonna be better served elsewhere. Yeah, that's. That's kind of my sense with Dungeons and Dragons as well. Is that you know, as I grew up playing it, it it's kind of a, an amalgamation of like any fantasy trope into whatever you know you want it to be. So it's great to play through because you can be kind of whatever you want. But it doesn't feel, or at least to me back then, I haven't played in many many years. It never felt like it was that coherent sort of world that you would go and explore and visit. It just felt more like a system that you could be anything. And I don't know if it's still like that, but it, you know, more, uh, it more or less is. I've been, I have been very critical over the years about that shit or get off the pot attitude regarding what sort of setting D and D is supposed to be. Because it, because I keep for ever since I started, I would hear people claim that you can use it to run all kinds of fantasy. But the problem yeah, is um, not that is yeah. a very very wide net. What I mean by the whole shit or get off the pot thing is, if you want if you want to build it for all if you want to build a game for 
theoretically all kinds of fantasy. You have to acknowledge that not everything is um, is in is in one genre of fantasy. That's you have sword and sorcery. You've got high. You've got low. You've got dark. You've got grim dark. You've got the stuff um, further east. You've right. got you've got the stuff for, you've got the stuff further west. <laughs> so. And if you're if you're gonna do that, you can't have specific names that are going to call to some sort of implied setting. A term I'm getting, I've gotten real sick of he of hearing because it is so, it is very much a case of having your cake and eating it too. Oh. Yeah. So so you you made the point earlier that uh, it's probably not the uh, Dungeons and Dragons license that's made Baldur's Gate so popular. So so what do you think it it is? Or... Um, I think, I think it is two, I think it's a couple things. One, the name Baldur's Gate does, ha does have a, does have a much stronger track record, whether it, th whether it be through the original games or through spin, or through spinoffs like say Ice, like say Icewind Dale or the, or the Dark Alliance games back in the, back on the PS2 or, um, or, e or even... Or, or even if even a few other entries within that general area. The other thing is, Larian Studios had built up had has basically been doing D and D games for oh, for over for about fifteen years up until that point. <laughs> Specifically yeah. with the Divinity series that they had been doing, and especially breaking out with Divinity Original Sin, which was a massive gamble that managed to pay off. Yeah, they they did def they had a very much a lot of practice, a lot of experience with making this style of game. I, I, have you played Baldur's Gate three or two? I have, I have I haven't been able to play as much because because of some other obligations. Um, I can I can say that it's do it's doing exactly what what it what it should be doing. Um, the f and truth be told, I've been pl I've been playing off and on since the early access. Um, almost a year ago, because that, oh, that's yeah. the other thing that definitely helped. They were con they were constantly iterating through feedback, doing the doing the early access thing. Um, right. but what's what's what has certainly what has certainly helped is ju is just not is just not pulling all of the stuff that people are getting really annoyed with in the in the current scene. You know all all of the nick all the nickel and diming shit. Yeah, um, it's it's amazing to me, and actually very kind of gratifying. You know, it makes makes me happy to see so many people praising the game for being a complete experience that you don't go off and have to buy a whole bunch of microtransaction for for you know every suit of armor you want or every die of clothing. Microtransactions it's, it's, yeah. are one problem, but there's one other problem that I feel. Does not does not get bullied enough, What's and that, that um, for lack of a better term, I call I call it the engagement problem, where you where you are doing th you're doing where certain um certain parts of the game's design are designed to do busy work so that you so that you end up spending more time playing, but you're, but it's more of playing as a chore rather than playing because. You want because you want to experience more of the world or the sandbox that the game's in, right? Yeah. So, so basically, like collectathon things, where it's go collect six feathers and then come back and that yeah, sort of get, thing. yeah. Get, go get rat tails for the innkeeper. <laughs> as, exactly. As, and I can under I can understand that kind of thing in the design of the design of some MMOs only to only in the point of teaching of teaching you the mechanics for when you start doing raids or the like you know much much in the way that um some people have seen single player campaigns and some shooters as just a glorified tutorial for the multiplayer they shouldn't it shouldn't be like that but some but that habit is there um thank you activision <laughs> yeah it, it it seems to me that you know over time there's kind of the the way that like the MMO RPG influenced our single player RPGs is that the MMO RPG was always trying to feed 
player's content, right? And that's where we get this these quest lines of go collect a bunch and come back, go collect a bunch and come back. But the funny thing, player, the funny thing about <laughs> that is, you can kind yeah. you can kind of split the from my perspective, and obviously I'm not I'm not a full on game developer aside from a few tabletop projects I've been working on. Um, but I, but I am a, re but I am a researcher. In fact, I've jokingly said I'm a better journalist than most games journalists. Um, you can kind of, I believe it. <laughs> you can kind of split the way um, MMOs have been developed into two camps: um, sandbox style and theme park style. Sandbox style is very, is very much the early cases. This is where you have your EverQuests, your Lineage Twos. Um, your your Star Wars Galaxies, my, one of my personal favorites, mm -hmm. personally. Um, where it's it's very much you have you have an area at, you have an area full of interactables and and it's about making your own experience. Um, on the other, you can you kind of see that sandbox style in in games like these days in games like Outward and Valheim. Um, and to, and most definitely in um, Minecraft, I'd say I'd say Minecraft is the modern equivalent of give of the blue bucket of Legos that I had as a little kid. Right. Yeah. Uh, whereas the theme park style is a significantly more curated experience. This this is where this this is the style that you have your World of Warcrafts in, and ga and games that were trying to ca carry that particular approach. Oh, you, you call it a theme park? Is that because you you kind of like go on a on a ride? You go go visit the the spot, and then you go do your little quest like a ride, and then you come back, and everybody just does the same ride. Is that is that kind of why you call it a theme park? Is is it, it's because it's more curated? It's more that guess, to to a point, yes, uh, to a point. Yeah. The other. Uh, of course, of course. Even i I'd say I'd say the last big entry that's that is in that that is in that sandbox style is probably Eve Online, but um, that is that is one particular rabbit hole I don't feel like going back in anytime soon. I've done my time. <laughs> like everybody makes jokes about Eve Online being the spreadsheet simulator, and they're not far off. Yeah, I I uh, I fired up Eve Online and I, I didn't spend much time there, but but I did put about five hundred hours into uh, Elite Dangerous, so <laughs> and Which so that's kind of a similar thing. Isn't far, isn't far off, and is this a bad time to mention that Elite Dangerous does have its own TTRPG? No, no. In fact, that's it's fine. Had, it's had two actually, one official and one not. Yeah, I, I didn't know. Does that go all the way back to the uh, original release by David Brayton, or is that something new? Um, but as for, as far as the TTRPG version of Elite Dangerous, um, yeah. Let me. So the uh, the official one, which was, pu which is the one that was, which is the one that was published by um, Spider Mind Games. Um, let me see. And and had some help from the people at Modifius. Um, that was published in tw in 2017. Oh, okay. So it's it's fairly recent. Um, uh, Elite Encounters, which is the which is the unofficial one. Uh, that was made. Let me let me see. Um. October first printing October twenty seventeen. So, yeah. <laughs> huh. That's uh. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. But but we were just mentioning just a moment ago about you know like tabletop RPGs versus the computer version of it, and we were talking about Baldur's Gate and Dungeons mm -hmm. and Dragons. And and to me, now I played about sixty hours so far of Baldur's Gate three, but I hadn't played Dungeons and Dragons in you know twenty twenty five years. So I'm I'm really impressed by Baldur's Gate three and how the rule set has been adopted to the computer, you know, environment. I think I think they've done a great job with it. It feels really good. 
hmm. um, for the limitations they put on. I'm 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 very impressed with it. Yeah, I I have some I have some issues with the, with the current with the current state of the fifth edition rule set, and of course the um the o, the OGL fiasco all the way back in January did not help matters, but I kind I kind of predict it. I predicted a few years ago that something was going to happen that was go that was going to cause a massive schism. I can't exactly say why I felt this way because I because I said that all the way back in um 2018. And I had I had a feeling something was going to happen. An announcement of a new edition was going to happen or there was going to be some announcement that was going to cause a massive um shitstorm. Mm -hmm. Um as far as as far as why I felt that way, a lot of it was the sheer bulk of people making third party material um, reminded me of the OGL bubble back in 2000, and how that created such a market flood that people just got sick of it by 2005, and the bubble ended up bursting. And I was in the mindset that something like that was going to be happening again. Too many people making OGL stuff, and the bubble's going to burst. I did not predict that Wizards of the Coast themselves would be complete idiots. <laughs> and so, so what? Do you, yeah, what happened? Oh, uh, now everybody knows about the about the attempted changes to the. You're familiar with the open gaming license, right? Well, I, I haven't been following the story, so that I'm out of. Uh, so I, I know about it secondhand, I guess. In two. Th so I need to give a bit of background first. In two thousand. Um, when Wizards of the Coast took the reins of D and D from T from TSR after TSR's colossal mis mismanagement, I don't need to go through that story. Um, they introduced a open gaming license. The idea being that anybody could make D and D um, compatible content as long as they followed a few rules. Now, technically speaking, since mechanics aren't copyrightable, you you don't need to have the open gaming license. But it was a nice gentleman's agreement for people. Especially sent, especially since it was meant to be a peace offering because of how Sue happy um, TSR was in their dying days. Okay. Uh, so that was introduced in 2000. There was there was a speed bump with the game system license in 2008, but that's another story. Keeps going along. Then back then back in in January. Um. The first warning sign was the new head of Wizards of the Coast, whose background was not in anything tabletop related, but in the video game division at Microsoft. And shortly after that, the the comment was made that the players are under monetized. Her words, not mine. And this was where, this was where that's, for lack of a better term, that spider sense starts tingling in my in the back. In the back of my mind. Yeah. Anytime your player base is under monetized, that just sounds like somebody's going to nickel and dime you, doesn't it? <laughs> I was. There were there were talks about about trying about trying to do some sort some sort of season pass thing with D and D a few years ago, but nothing came of it. Um, and I was getting reminded of that. But then, now there. Then the then the shoe then the shoe drops, with the with the fact that they want they want um third part they want third party developers to fall to fall under a royalty program, um that oh. caused them, i e that i e that if you had a certain amount of operating revenue not profit operating revenue that you had to pay a certain amount of a certain percentage of royalties. Now, what that percentage was was never stated, and it never it never got that far because just the just the thought of of being of being of the developers being dimed like this um, caused a massive massive um, uproar, and thousands of people had had unsubscribed from um, the D and D Beyond service. The this was this was right around the time that they were talking about doing this ref, this refined version of um, D and D called One D and D, which I've looked at some of the playtests for it, and th and it's a masterclass of missing the point with some of the designs. But 
they after after that they tried to say, oh, that was just a draft. Nobody bought that it was just a draft. <laughs> They tried. They tried to put out a, a new revised version, which had a very vaguely worded morality clause. To to the point, base basically, if they if, and the fact that by putting something out, you are you're granting a perpetual royalty free license to them to use how, for them to use it how they wished, and nobody was happy with it. I covered this in a post mortem, but the but the whole time. I kept getting the vibe that the cur that the new boss over over at Wizards of the Coast was somebody who did not understand the ecosystem when it comes to tabletop RPGs and how vital the thir the third party end of things is to the to the um gr to the growth of of any TTRPG. Um, yeah, I. L do you remember? Do you remember that incident a few years ago when Bethesda tried to monetize the modding community for Fallout and Skyrim? Right. Yeah, I, and I can I can totally see why. Yeah, this is making a lot of sense as you're explaining that they're basically trying to monetize their own customer base that was supplying them with a lot of content for their yeah I, yeah. Oh. I, I can see how this would be very troubling to the players. Yeah. Both players and developers of third-party content, um, yeah, several of which said, "Screw this, we're not wor we're not working with you," <laughs> and and either either some some of them said it out when um when they eventually when they eventually caved and put the and put the open gaming license under a Creative Commons license, which fortunately um there's no way to do takebacks on that unless you want unless you want to get yourself in legal hot water. Um, I can't help but suspect that the reason they ended up caving was because one of their investors called them out publicly. Call, calling them, call, first off, calling the calling Wizards of the Coast leaderless, and second, saying that the OGL move was a unforced error. Basically, that it was real fucking stupid to do this about uh, uh, about a few weeks away from the release of the movie that they've been putting that they put so much investment in. And well, as you saw, that movie flopped. You're right. Uh, which I haven't seen it. I, you know, everybody who I know who's seen it said it's a pretty good movie, but I, I haven't seen it. It's so, not bad. Yeah, it's not it's bad. It's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Like it's a, de it's a. I'd say it's a decent, um, a decent, po a decent popcorn flick, and it'll probably be one of be one of those things that you that you watch with some drinking buddies. But it was it. But the problem the problem was an inability to read the room. Like I like I said, there's no there there would be more appeal in ad in adapting some in adapting some of the Drizzt novels if you really if you really want to do a D and D movie or ad or adapting settings with characters that people already have um, a connection with. Um, of course, there's the other the other problem with doing something like that is we already have we already have something that's already doing that in the form of the in the form of the Legend of Vox Machina, which it which isn't something that Wizards of the Coast can claim any can claim any ownership to. Um, but if somebody if somebody really really insists on, insisted on doing that, we already have a D and D movie. It's called Darkness Rising. <laughs> I don't know that one. The, the, pro yeah. the problem was the, the the problem was um it's a case of what if you gave a war and nobody came? There was no there was no uh, there was no audience for a D and D movie. Now would, could you do a movie about Dr about Drizzt and ba and base it on the um the novels that Ari Salvatore did? Absolutely, I'd actually say that would have a better chance. Right, because it wouldn't be based on a, on a license. It would be based on a story and or a character. Yeah. I've argued for the longest time that the Dragonlance novels, especially especially like the Dragons of Autumn Twilight series, mm -hmm. that is almost tailor made for for a movie. You wouldn't have to change too much to get a script out of that. You might have to trim the fat because you can get away with more stuff in a book than you can in a script, but. Half the work, but with the, with both of those, half the work's already done for you. 
Yeah, I I, uh, I definitely remember those books from uh, high school. Dragon's Bottom, Twilight, Dragons of what is it, Winter, Dawning or something like that. Spring, yeah. Spring Dawning and mm-hmm. Winter something, well, Winter yeah. Twilight or something. Anyway, yeah, those are I remember those books being like really amazing. That would be a great series. Mm-hmm. They have the uh, characters that people recognize. They're easy to pick up on. And in fact, I think a lot of people read those books, the the Tracy Hickman books. Uh, Margaret Weiss, Tracy Hickman, read those books without even playing Dungeons and Dragons and knowing that it came from Dungeons and Dragons uh, series, right? Yeah. yeah. If you if you absolutely have to build it on a setting, um, build it on a then build it on one of the settings that there isn't really an analog for in popular media right now. There's two that come to mind that I guarantee no nobody in that company would have the balls to do it. <laughs> um. And bo- both of, and both of these are in are in the old are in the um older end of things. Um, one of them is Spelljammer. <laughs> There's no, no way anybody's gonna do that. Um, and the other one is Dark Sun. Yeah, that one's that that one. I don't think has much recognizability outside of probably a small group of players. Probably, yeah. probably not. But you, but you could, you could bill it as something different, because again, there, yeah. there isn't really an analog for either of those in um, popular media. Um, as far, because as far as as far as doing a de- a desert themed epic fantasy, how much? What do, what do we have? What do we have in the last few years that fits that bill? Dune. That's a special case. Then <laughs> that's apples and oranges, if I ever heard it. And right. for spell for spell jammer, there's de- the clo- the only thing that comes close is Treasure Planet, and that was years ago. Yeah. So so we were talking about OGL, this open gaming license mm-hmm. that um, so I guess that the Wizard of the Coast was using for all of their their third parties. So is that? Uh, forgive me if I don't understand how structured. I just know how video games work. Like when we, like when we're making Hogwarts Legacy, and we go to submit, we have to take our version of the game and send it to the respective, you know, uh, publishers, Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft, and they will review our game to make sure it meets quality standards, runs on our platform, and fits all the things before they will release it. Is it the same thing with Wizards of the Coast? Do you like have to submit your your modules or nope. your? No. Okay. So how does it work? There, there is a certain document that you'd ha- that you have to put in in li- in like the back of it. Um, there are there are certain there is a short list of of names and things that you can't that you can't use, um, because they're not they're not part of that o- of that OGL. But it, but aside from that, everything everything's free game, and as long as you op- as long as you follow the, those particular rules, um. You can put that out, put it in a PDF form, put it in, put it on Drive Through RPG or any other um, store store page, and that's it. The OGL was very was very hands off because the idea the idea was to uh, to allow uh, to allow other people to fill in niches that they weren't going to do, which which meant um, having a having the lowest barrier to entry possible. I see. So so they they were using. Forgive me for putting it in these terms, if I understand it right. But they they were using their their player base or their their fans to flesh out their world. But then they wanted to collect some of the money from their fans doing this. Is that correct? Yeah. the the pro, The problem is, as as far as that whole as far as that whole collecting money, um, they only wanted to do this like twenty years after the fact. When a long <laughs> precedent had been set, and there are hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of PDFs that they're tr- that they were trying to retroactively say, "You now owe us royalties," mm-hmm. even if some of them are from companies that no longer exist. Yeah, that's a that's a mess. Yeah. Um, and be- and because of that, all the all the blowback was justified. Um, they tried. They've they've. There's been a few. The dust has somewhat settled, but as far as the stuff that's come out recently, with the with the books, there's nothing that's been all that all that appealing. I mean, they they made a big deal about how they were bringing back Planescape and Spelljam, and I'm like, ooh, you should have done this five years ago. Big fucking deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
especially especially when I can just say I've got Spelljammer at home. <laughs> but the but of co of course the more interesting stuff has always been in the third party end because it doesn't have to deal with the tradition problems. And a good ca a um a good case in point has been Tales of the Valiant, which is kind of do kind of do which is essentially doing a more doing a refined improvement that I, that people were asking for for years, um, and it's being done by Cobalt Press, who has a long track record of putting out good um, third party content. They just decide they just decided to um, to go to go past the threshold and and build their own version to use as a template going forward, but. If I if I want if I want to make a um, D and D module, all I'd have to do is just write write out whatever module I'm doing, put the open gaming license agreement at the back end of the, at the back end of the book, and ju just um and just sell it. I don't have to go. Ooh. I don't need Wizards of the Coast permission. And yeah, I I didn't know that's how that works. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Thanks for explaining that. It is. It is very. It is very much a. Oh, it is very much an open because it was. It was built on a lot of open. So, it was built on the concept of a lot of open software licenses. Um, you know th how certain programs are tailor made to be, um, forked and messed around with, and there and there is a understood agreement of that. Right. It's in the. It's in the same vein as that. And because because of because of that, a lot of people ended up ended up jumping up ended up jumping off the boat onto uh, onto other things. Um, and I I the reason why I liken it to um to when Bethesda tried to mon tried to um do the whole paid mods thing twice and mm -hmm. it and it didn't work but first with the infamous horse armor thing back in oblivion and then years later with the creation club um those kind of things are always going to be doomed to fail in my opinion because of one partic because of one word logistics like how are you how are you going to meet out, how are you going to meet out how much that they're supposed to be get they're supposed to be getting and if you're do if you're doing this are are you not treating modders as freelancers? Right. Yeah. Which that that's a whole that's a whole other legal quagmire because the I'm not a lawyer, but I think the argument could be made that if you're trying to if you're if you're um having people submit these kind of things to to make money, um, then it's 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 and it is akin to freelance work. Yeah, um, and it, I don't know. It's it's really kind of a strange gray area, and it seems to change between published stuff like the tabletop and digital media, like you see in video games and mods for, like you know, uh, Skyrim that's, or whatever. That's why I said yeah. that bringing in somebody yeah. who had only worked in video games was that was the first red flag. Um, right. I, yeah. Yes, it's a when different, I, different yeah. It 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 is it. it even even though there's cr even though there's crossover between the two, um, the ecosystem that they operate in is practically night and day. And the analogy I I had used when this whole thing went down was comparing her to um, Vince McMahon in the first incarnation of the XFL, which was a disaster oh. and a half that <laughs> has been well covered. But in particular, when Vince um, did that interview with. Bo did that interview opposite of Bob Costas, and Costas just ate him alive. <laughs> it's like I'm because I remember because yeah. the thing is, Vince had no concept of football culture. Like when he, when asked about when asked about his favorite football player, he said Wahoo McDaniel. Wahoo McDaniel was more of a wrestler than he in in the Texas area than he than he was a football player. He was a big he was a big deal in college football, but. Anybody who plays football, who plays college football in Texas, is a big deal in Texas. 
That's not, yeah. that's not that's exactly it. narrowing it down much. That that XFL callback. When was that? That was that was. Um, two, right? That was two. That was two thousand. The that first the first yeah. incarnation was two thousand, where they tried to mix football and re and wrestling. It did not work at all. Um, and that's been well documented. The then there was that more recent version that started out in twenty ninth in um twenty twenty, which was doing everything right. It's just that right as it was starting to get momentum, COVID happened. And then there's the more recent one, which is fine and actually managed to finally finish a season. Um, there's been there's been a whole debate about whether or not um spring whether or not spring leagues in pro football can can work. I think there is markets for it, but you'd have to you do you'd have to use markets that um aren't are, aren't already being served. Oh. That at that end, regardless of regardless of who does it, there's going to be some growing pains because, well, and well, no startup is expected to be profitable in the first year. Right. Yeah. Especially when you're trying to establish a new a new market. But. <clears throat> well, that's that's an interesting analogy you made there between the XFL and Vince McMahon coming in saying, "Hey, we're gonna you know we're gonna come in and." bring our wrestling uh, kind of way of seeing the world into the NFL and make something cool. And, and you're right, it, it did not work at all. I remember mm -hmm. being like, what the heck is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back around 2000, I guess. Yeah, it's... Uh, same the, thing here with Wizards of the Coast. And, yeah, the other, the other thing is um, they were... And this, this, was one, this was one thing that they've been pushing that I thought was a real bad move is... The, is one of the big reasons for all of their changes was trying to do a ver, trying to do their own virtual tabletop, um, which ha, virtual tabletops have been quite have been quite a big thing, and of course ended up having a bit of an explosion during the during the pandemic because everybody's stuck inside with nothing to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they made there were two major mistakes that they made. Um, the first of which is. Is just is just making is just making their own virtual tabletop when it's a very very crowded market as it is, with a lot of with a lot of ver a lot of game a lot of um platforms that have been around for a while and are very feature rich. That was the first mistake, because you have to because that that level of feature richness that is the baseline you have to meet. If you can't meet that, right. you're going to have problems. So they're, Pro they're coming in from behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Problem two, they built it on using 3D graphics using the Unreal Engine. No other virtual tape... The amount of virtual tabletops that have a large following are not doing that. And there's a very clear... There's a very good reason why. Most of them are, are cloud-based for one, but also... You, but also are built around the idea of of being res being as resource unintensive as they can so that you so that you could play it on a computer, a tablet, a, fo a phone, what have you. Now, I wouldn't I wouldn't yeah. recommend using it using your smartphone for for it, but the options there for those who want to take it, especially for those people who have those giant slabs of smartphones that they can't even fit into their pockets anymore. I don't know. Maybe we'll yeah, so maybe we'll have a return of the um of the sling that people had for the brick back in the eighties. <laughs> so, so the existing successful product is very lightweight. It sounds like, and and the, they come in with this. We're going to make a a new product that's heavier than what's out there, and well, it doesn't doesn't make any need, and, and it's behind. Yeah. I found out a few months ago that the reason they the reason they built it on Unreal is because they want to put this not just on PCs but on. Um, gaming consoles, you know, P PS5, yeah, X man. Xbox Series, X Xbox Series X, Switch. You get you get the idea, and that is a terrible idea. Because if somebody wants a D and D like experience on, say, a, on say a PS5, they'll just play Baldur's Gate three. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, I would totally agree that that the advantage of having some sort of tabletop 
simulation game platform there so that you can play with your friends and do things that you couldn't do in a, in a regulated game like Baldur's Gate 3 where basically the dungeon master is being run by the computer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I, I, I agree with you. And of, co- of course there's also, there's also the fact that because I kind I kind of wish I was at the creator summit where they talked where they talked about it and believe you me if I was at it you would have heard about it because because I guarantee you I would have caused a scene <laughs> but there was no men- there was no mention of ho- of how of how this v- of how this VTT that's using Unreal is going to s- is going to support house rules or cu- or custom cu- or custom content and that to me is a deal breaker. Yes, yeah. There's there's a real difference in the experience of gameplay with your friends around the tabletop and the experience of of having the rules being run by a, by a computer system. And uh, and I think it sounds to me like maybe Wizards of the Coast doesn't understand this at the level of what they're trying to make for a tool. Po- possibly. Um, I've joked I've joked about how nobody plays Uno as written. Mm-hmm. And. It, and... In that same vein, I, gar- I guarantee no two tables of any tabletop RPG, even if they're playing the same game, they're not playing it the same way. Right. Yeah. Like, everybody's gonna have their own. Yeah. Uh, you roll a twenty, and whatever. Yeah. You have your critical hit or whatever. Yeah. Everybody's Absolutely. gonna have home brews or or house rules and the like, and Gygax encouraged that. Right. And he he's he was on record multiple times. Want, wanting people to customize the game for their own liking, which is which makes makes the whole RPGA thing a bit weird, but that's another story. But how are you? Get, but the the people who would be able to do that are going are going to be modders who have um, experience with Unreal, and that's going to be a much narrower um, pool. Yep, that's true. Because. Uh... Yeah, Unreal. There's a learning curve there, so people would have to spend a lot of time getting up to speed on on that sort of system. And I've I've dabbled with messing around with Unreal, and I and that was enough for me to for me to say I for me to say this that um I I am <coughs> I it, there is not enough alcohol in the world to get to get me to do this. Fair play to the fair play to those who do, but I I've I've already done my time as far as being a code monkey. I don't want. So what to, did you do? Um, I was mostly I was mostly where I had spent I had spent a cup of coffee doing web doing um stuff when it comes to web usability and if I never have to look at another line of HTML code I will be very very happy. Cool. <laughs> or <laughs> just or just some of the really bad designs that people have with websites. I still get triggered when I see bad navigation on websites. Or just bad navigation. Period. Um, yeah, I guess it's, that's your area of expertise there. Yeah, <laughs> it's it it is it. I haven't I haven't done it in a while, and if I lo- if I look at um, any any modern code, I'm gonna have no idea what's going on. Then again, most coders have no idea what's going on when they look at their own code. <laughs> yeah, you got to go back. Can't remember what they were doing. Oh. So we. Mm-hmm. We spoke a few minutes ago that you played early access on, on Baldur's Gate three. Yeah, I've been playing. I've been playing the release version, and um, the the thing that appeals to me the most about the game so far, and it kind of surprises me, but is the um, the the ability to make characters really crap really quickly. Like I can go in and remake my character with withers, and and just the character creation stuff is I think pretty slick here. Is I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm curious as to your opinion if, if you um, have much experience with the Baldur's Gate character creation stuff and just kind of the D and D fifth edition for character creation in general. Um, I shouldn't. I should note that it's, and this this is the smart thing. It's not. Tr- it's not trying to do. It's not trying to do the ex- the ex- an exact replication of the rule set, but rather um, a modification of it with the understanding that this is a video game. Mm-hmm. There's cer- there's certainly a lot of there's certainly a lot of similarities, 
but it do, but it does do its tweaks as far as, as far as character creation um there it is i think i think the thing that i found i found really funny was was not the character creator itself but rather how um how how um, Larian Studios ca- kind of got memed on because that because they had expressed disappointment that so many people were making human fighters with with all of the choices that they had, and I was right. sitting there going, <laughs> "What did what did you expect? People are people are going to use what they consider a baseline before they do get a feel for things before they do the crazy stuff. It's like asking someone to boot up Doom and and immediately expecting them to play on Nightmare. Right? Yeah. I've kind of what they want to do the like. I don't know about you, but whenever it comes to whenever it comes to picking up video games, I never start on the hardest difficulty if that's if that's even an option. Um, I'll start I'll start with either easy or medium, just so I can get a feel for what works, and then I'll up the difficulty based on how based on how comfortable I feel. Yeah, I'm 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 very similar. It, it actually different people I think are attracted to different aspects of games, and uh, there was. I don't know if we want to go sideways here, but there was a, um, I guess you would call it a paper. I think it was at a game developers conference by a fellow named Bartleby about like the four types of players that play both tabletop games and MMORPGs and just kind of video games in general. And he based it around a deck of cards that, that there were four suits of, um, like the, the four suits relate to four different personality types for players. And I always thought that was interesting. And, and, and just real quickly, the four suits were diamonds, which were players who play to achieve things, you know, like diamonds for achievement. There were players who uh, were clubs, and they were players who play to beat things up and sometimes to break the game or whatever. There were players who played for spades. They were people who liked to dig things up and discover how things work. Usually, like, people were really into rules. And then there were players who were hearts, and they were players who play for the social aspect and in interacting with other players. And, and so those four types of game like mindsets I found very useful over the years. And it all started from this this paper. Um, I think it was on MMORPGs by a guy named Bartleby. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there yeah. as uh, as a thought. Mm-hmm. Um, that's def- definitely the case. I can I kind of wit I kind of um, I kind of wish I had gone I had gone to more GDCs, but um, uh, but. I don't. I don't know. Maybe, maybe maybe I'm too tall for that. <laughs> <laughs> too tall? <laughs> I'm six six. <laughs> well, you just stand out. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I did go. I did go to E3 once, and I was t- and everybody everybody there was was. If I if I did it, if I took a shot for every time somebody said, "God, you're tall," then I'd be dead. <laughs> um. Yeah, I will. I I will note as a bit of an aside. Would it surprise you at all if I if I said that the um, class of choice that I I end up go I end up going with in Baldur's Gate three is monk. Monk. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't be surprised that you know Mildred the monk, but <laughs> well, I I was I grew up on martial arts mov- movies, and I and I'll always like playing more more um more of that more of that approach. Um, I'd prob I'd probably play fi- I'd probably play fighters if if um if fighters weren't treated so vanilla by so many games. That's just that's just a personal pet peeve of mine. Um, yeah. I I don't like the concept of the basic fighter that pe- that people have kind of treated that archetype over the years. Yeah, it is pretty straightforward. What what do you think about the the monk in Baldur's Gate? It's Basically, the it's basically the five e five e monk, and with all of the benefits and drawbacks, um, five five elements is five elements is still a mess. Um, op, open ha- um, open hand is is what it is. Way of sh- way of shadow is we want to be ninjas, but we don't want to admit that we're ninjas. <laughs> um, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do kind of wish some of some of the ex, some of the expanded ones were were in there, but I'm pretty sure someone's going to mod that in in time. Um, I I can de- I I can definitely say that this particular this isn't my favorite iteration of the monk class, but 
it, it but it it gets more it gets more or less the job done and it's certainly better than the monk back in th back in third edition and even more so the monk that was in oriental adventures back in the day um cuz yeah. well the the problem with the problem with the one in oriental adventures was it was it was a glorified kit bash um try, trying to bl trying to blend in the <sighs> Trying to trying to give a trying to give a cleric character thief skills, there was a lot of that whole let's just let's take two classes together, ba um, mix their mix their stuff and call it a new class, or there right. were, or there were classes that were just really badly designed at the time, like say the barbarian and the ranger, um, because there was that whole thing of oh if, oh if you're barbarian and you find a magic item you have to destroy it. Until you're, I think, I think it was like eighth level or something. You can finally equip magic items, except the fighters been able to do that since day one. So whoop de do. Um, with with ranger, you have the problem of so, of so many of it. So many of its features require being outdoors in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there was there was also the fact that you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't equip heavier ar um, metal armor, and because of the way armor worked in relation with Thaco, that meant you were very squishy to the point where Ranger Down became a running joke. Yeah, yeah. When, when did that? When when did that? Uh, was it Thaco to, to hit armor class zero? That that started, I think, even after I was playing that. Um, that was Thaco. Thaco was there since day one. Really. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember it in the very early editions. But... Yeah, that that was uh -huh. the that was the main way you deter you determined how you hit because of the we because of the weird um, thing of a of adding the target's armor class to the to the minimum. Yeah, it was. It, it used to be the lower the number, the harder it was to hit, and it was always weird. Like, oh, you had an armor class of negative two. Well, that was like a great thing. It was really hard to hit, or something. Yeah. Yeah. The the thing. This is the reason. I th this is the reason I think ascent, um, because the the reason it's the lower number is you would you would look at what your Thaco is, then you'd look at the target's AC, you'd add the target's a you'd add the target's AC to the to that number, and that and that's what you had to roll over in order to hit. So if somebody had a Thaco of ten, and they and there's an armor class of like of like of like two of like um. Of like two, um, you'd have to you'd have to roll you have to roll twelve, and I'm, I'm I may be I may be messing around with it. The point it the point is it was it was not well explained, and I think the reason ascending AC instead of the descending thing was used was because it was far more intuitive. Like this is this is this is your AC enemies attacking you need to need to get over this in order to hit you. Boom, done. Yes, yeah, I I totally agree. That that's something that to me it looks like it's it's changed over the years. I you know I haven't followed the tabletop world uh, clearly, mm -hmm. um, but then I come back to it and I'm like, oh well, this this is a lot easier to understand. And uh, I I think that that's a good thing. That kind of the synergy between the computer game and the tabletop has made some rules problems simplified just because it's easier for players to understand. I'd say it, I'd say it's. A combination of that and the fact that there's been the drifting, there's been the decoupling of the of the war game of that of that college war gaming mindset that permeated the early days, because that that's where oh. the whole thing really got started was the was the war gaming scene of the 70s and a lot of that was re was really all over the place in the college scene in the Midwest. Oh, uh, the. You know, with you know people people doing war games and being a bunch of history nerds. The prop the problem is, um, that o that's on that only is going to get you so, um so far. And I I should I do have to correct myself. There were some, there there were, the version of Thaco that everybody knows that was in AD and D second. There were, um, there there were um predecessors to predecessors to it, but it was. It was based on um, on a bunch of charts because again this again wargaming because 
you look at a lot of those old war games that like Avalon Hill put out in there and it is chart hell. Um yeah. and a lot of um a lot of subsystems. And something something that happened I want to say the 90s. It's hard to pin down exactly when this happened, but you started to see this mindset of a set of a centralized mechanic that ev that everything builds around of. I I call this all roads lead to Rome. Like um I'll use since since we've used D&D &D for a lot of this, I will use I'll use um World of Darkness as as my example for this. The storyteller system is built around um, take attribute plus your skill, roll that many d10s. Anything that is a eight, nine, or ten is a hit. You compare the hits to a target number. Um, if you roll, t if you if you get a ten, those if you get a ten, those count twice. Uh, and everything else is just exceptions or at or add-ons to that formula. Right. Yeah, and and I, I I can see how you do the same thing in a in a computer game a little differently, where you you have like what they call a core gameplay loop, right? You do the same kind of thing over and over, whether it's you know collecting your your loot and then leveling up your character and then getting a bigger weapon and yeah, I that, that cycle. Yeah, I I forget who I forget who said it, but I, I remember a developer at Bungie say um in a, a making of documentary for Halo saying if you can. If you can create 15 seconds of fun, you can stretch that out into a whole game. Um, oh, yeah. Though he's I think Alex Seropian said that. <laughs> he's since gone on record as being frustrated by how people took that. Because, I, because the way he described it, people took it too literal. That that you could take that 15 seconds and make that the enti and make that the entire game that's going to stretch out over hours. When what he was trying to get at is, you have that fifteen seconds, and then you keep iter you keep iterating and messing with that fifteen seconds and segments. And I'm not sure if you would I'm not sure if you had ever played Combat Evolved, but consider this: first the f the first chapter, you're in the Pillar of Autumn, you're dealing with very confined firefights. Then you're on Halo, and the and you're still in firefights, but it's now a more open map. Then vehicles start getting introduced. Then more specialized weapons and, and enemies start getting introduced. It's the same, the same gameplay loop, but the context keeps changing. Right. Yeah. You, you kind of layer more things on top of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Layer more things, or cha or cha or change how the fifteen seconds um, works in works in the player's eyes. But it's n but you but you can't just have that fifteen seconds um, ad infinitum. Right, yeah, it's boring if you don't. Mm -hmm. And but I'm, I've only got a few more minutes here, Mildred. <laughs> I just don't... yeah. So sorry if I, sorry if I got a little um if I got a little carried away, um. But one thing now, one thing I did, one thing I was kind of curious curious about is because when it when I look at when I look at the back, there's a few, there's a few things that I was that. I def I definitely found interesting, um, one of one of them being some some of the sport adjacent stuff, and then doing something like something like Hogwarts Legacy. How how did you end up getting roped into that project? Because it was a surprise when I saw your name attached to it. To, to Hogwarts Legacy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it was done by Avalanche, right? Which mm -hmm. is a studio in Salt Lake, and. Prior to doing Hogwarts Legacy, they, they did Disney Infinity for Disney. Uh, for Yeah, so Disney Infinity was done for the big Disney Corporation. And it was that experience with intellectual property on Disney Infinity and the prior products for Disney that made Warner Brothers recognize that if they wanted studio to treat the intellectual property well, that Avalanche was a good studio to do that because they had just worked with it so much. Mm -hmm. So that's why... I got associated with it was because after Disney shut the Avalanche studio, Warner Brothers started the new studio. They wanted to make this new game. And then the guys over there at the Avalanche contacted me and said, Hey, you know, come on back. We're, we're making this game. And, and uh, I was, I was excited by the opportunity to work on an intellectual property like 
the you know the wizarding world and they gave us the latitude to say all right we're going to let you make your own story you know your own characters in a new timeline um so that players can explore kind of role play uh with the wizard that they want to be and that was really appealing to me about the whole opportunity was let players not be harry not be hermione but be their own wizard for once right so that yeah, was a, a, a i <clears throat> I remember. I remember saying that 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 kind of thing was part, was part of the appeal. Since, um, I remember to you to use a tabletop analogy, a lot of people kind of forget that at one point TSR had an Indiana Jones RPG. Now, there's a reason why a lot of people have forgotten this. You'd think, oh, in, Indiana Jones in the '80s, how could people forget about this? Well, it was how they did it. It didn't have character creation. Instead, you were expected to play as what they th they thought that people would want would just want to play as one of the ca one of the cast members from the films, yeah, which yeah. they get which that game got roasted alive in the in the reviews at the time. Oh, and I I read a few of them and it and it was a case of you'd be bet you'd be better off playing any pulp adventure and just skin and just. Making Indiana Jones references in it than the than this official one because of that, because that's because that's not what because anybody who would want to do an Indiana Jones RPG doesn't want to play as doesn't want to play as Indy or Short Round or any or any of the cast members. They want to play in that particular world. Right, they kind of want to be themselves or the character that they imagine themselves being. Yeah. It's to me, the, the whole RPG thing, what appeals to people is that exploration of possibilities. Mm -hmm. and, and if you take that away from people, then they feel like they're playing out somebody else's story, and they, they don't seem to enjoy that as much. They need yeah. to play their own story. Now, I know some people will say but, but you, about um, playing someone else's story in a lot of console-style RPGs, mm -hmm. but... That, but that is a different, that is a different um, particular, ca particular can of worms. And in that and in that in, in that instance, it's best to think of it akin to playing the ch playing something like the Choose Your Own Adventure books or the Death Trap Dungeon books, which apparently were bigger in the UK than they were in the than that particular style was in the States. Those game books were huge over over in over over across the pond, but character. Character creation can can add to an RPG, but it's but it isn't a it isn't necessarily a necessity. And in the case in the case of the stuff that was coming out of Japan, there was there was a concept in tabletop games called replays that was com that was very very popular. A replay is a, was essentially think think of an actual play podcast in written form. That was that was a replay. Um, you were re you were reading out the the that particular adventure, and I look at the way stuff like Final Fantasy or the Tales series and the like developed as kind of a reflection of that more than anything else. Right. But it it's it's definitely a fa it's definitely a fascinating beast and. I remember when somebody when somebody said that when somebody said to me, "What's so special about Hogwarts Legacy when there's plenty of open world games out there that's doing the same thing?" And I said, "Focusing on open world is is missing the point. It's like it's like saying that a set of course a competizione is bet is a better is better than F1 because of um its physics engine. It's not just that it's not just that because the only people that's going to appeal to are the Point zero zero one percent. It is in so, in something like the Codemasters F one game to use the, an example of that. The fact that you are going through the whole F one experience, not just racing on the tracks, but also having to deal with pit strategy, having to deal with main with maintaining maintaining your equipment, having to deal with the po the possibility of mo of moving up or down the grid, having to deal with qualifying. Having to deal with the rules so you don't get black flagged or or mess around with people on blue flags. Having to do the the same experience that they get watching F1, just being a part of it and being on a particular team. Right. Yeah. 
I, I believe that players have an expectation for authenticity, right? That that's mm-hmm. what they're looking for. This feels authentic to my experience. And, and I feel for Hogwarts Legacy, that was a big part of the team's development philosophy was let's make this as authentic to lore as possible so that when people come to play, they feel like, hey, I'm finally getting to be a witch or wizard and I always wanted to be. Um, did you, did you, did you end up getting, did you end up getting sent the, um, any, any sort of books, like, re, like research material in, in, during development? No, we did not. Um, everybody just went and, and gathered their own research material. So we didn't have anything in particular that came from J.K. Rowling. However, there is an organization that J.K. has put together. It's called the Blair Partnership. And their job is to oversee all of the different intellectual property work being done in the wizarding world, whether it's video games or whether it's theme parks or, you know, food, whatever it might be. And so we would interface with them and they would review stories and characters and game development to make sure that it's fit with their lore requirements. And I, um, I guess I, I guess I could liken that kind of thing to what's to what Star to what Skywalker Ranch was, but I suppose a better analogy is something I learned talking with people who worked in television, and that is the concept of a series bible. Yes, yeah. Which is a concept yeah. I wish I could say I say I came up with, but no, that's not the case. It's been a thing for as long as I can remember, but it's basically a document to try and keep everything consistent. Yeah, um, I, uh, I, I've seen it at other franchises, but the one that I remember it the most for, interestingly, was uh, Cars from Pixar. They actually had a guy who was called the Franchise Guardian, and it was his job to go and make sure that anything related to Cars was fitting the right you know, aesthetic style, and the, you know, make sure the eyes are right, make sure the grill is right, make sure all the art and coloring is correct for all the toys, all the, you know, all that. And and that was that was his role, franchise guardian, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I think is good. You know, that's a good thing to yeah. have. Now, I remember I remember a while back you said you were writing, you were in the process of writing a fantasy novel. Um, what can you tell me about that? Yeah, so um, it was just kind of a hobby thing. I wrote the first in a three part series of books. The first book is is out, and I self published it. it it's. Uh, kind of an epic fantasy thing that was built around a lot of religious thoughts that I was having because I grew up LDS or, or Mormon, but I haven't mm-hmm. been you know, a believer for many, many years. So anyway, that's what got me started on it. But I've only written the first book, and I want to write the next two. And I started writing the second on it, but then I realized that I needed to make edits to the first, and because it's all just kind of a hobby project, I haven't really pursued it much more than that, other than I'm like, eh. At some point, I need to do the rest of this, but so far, there's just the first book self-published out there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> don't know what else to say about it, other well, than it was kind of a hobby project. In this temple, you're in good company as far as self-publishing. So that's how so <laughs> many. Like there's there's 700 interviews in the in this on this channel that that have and a good chunk of them are self-publishing. Yeah, in, in today's world, you can you can totally do it if you just find an audience. And, and in my case, I wasn't trying to you know make money or anything. It was just to go through the process of, of trying to finish something enough that you could actually present it. You know? mm-hmm. And with the, I know I know I know there I know there's a bit of a ti- a bit of a time crunch, but I do but. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yes, th- and, thanks for having me on. Uh, I, you know, I can come back some other time when maybe you've got a little more time to do things. But yeah, mm-hmm. thank you for having yeah. me. Um, I I hope it's not another four year four years before we do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, now that we can just do it over Discord, we can surely set something up. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Keep that in mind tonight. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. 
And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>